We have the first generation of American children whose life expectancy is shorter than that of their parents. Turning the tide on childhood obesity in the Commonwealth, tonight we examine new initiatives aimed at combating a growing problem. This is What Matters. Good evening, I'm Kathy Lewis. If you are of a certain age, you will no doubt remember the ravages of polio. Well, one of our guests tonight says that overeating is every bit as dangerous as polio before the sock vaccine. The culprit is food. One in three of our children are seriously overweight, and now there's a full court press to figure out what to do about it. Joining us is Kate Eggleston. She's a policy analyst with the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy. Also with us tonight, Dr. Donald Lewis from the Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters in Norfolk. Thanks to both of you for being with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Lewis, you were featured at the top of the show talking about this statistic that I think a lot of people would find horrifying, given our advanced state of medical science, that despite all of that, this generation may have a shorter life expectancy than their parents. What's going it, on? It's, it's one of the most scary statements you can hear. If, if anybody who's the hair on their back of the neck doesn't stand up when they hear that uh, has something seriously wrong with them. It is truly an epidemic. Uh, one in three children are overweight or obese. Uh, obesity leads to hypertension and type 2 diabetes. Those two things together. Uh, severely affect the blood vessels throughout our body, particularly the heart, the brain, and the kidney. It leads to, to um, uh, downstream complications of early heart attack, uh, early renal failure. Uh, it's just a vicious cycle that we're in, and the facts are very clear. Mm. As I, we said in the very beginning promo, um, this is the first generation of American children whose life expectancy is shorter than that of their parents. A frightening statistic. Uh, is there a way to, uh, I mean, we think about ways to combat that, and that's what we're going to talk about in the course of the program. Uh, I wonder if there's a way to um, communicate what's at stake here. You, uh, you, you talk about type 2 diabetes. You mentioned mm -hmm. that. Uh, this is something I guess you didn't used to see until people were much, much older. True. Um, and when I was in medical school in the 70s, uh, we didn't even learn about type 2 di diabetes because it didn't, wasn't a disease. It didn't have it. But with the growing wow. number of children who are over, overweight and obese, we're starting to see it. And probably 12, 15 years ago, we started to see the first cases, and now it's very common. Uh, and it's clear sequence of these kids uh, having more and more problem with the complications of diabetes, so the eye, the kidney, the heart, uh, the complications of hypertension. Um, and we're going to have a whole generation of young adults who are going to be having heart attacks, um, strokes, uh, horrible, devastating, dis disabling conditions because of these complications. I mean, it's preventable. Mm. We can help get these kids on the path to wellness. Uh, we just can't write off this generation. Uh, and so how do you go, I mean, I, I think one of the most difficult things would be to talk to someone about that in your, in your doctor's office. We know that there have been studies produced, and it's less so now, uh, that, that noted that doctors will sometimes talk all around the problem. They'll talk about the heart disease. Oh, you have symptoms of heart disease. Or they'll talk about, oh, you have type 2 diabetes, but n not kind of get to the core issue there. I know you probably are so concerned about this that you're being pretty direct about it, but I wonder how you go about talking about this well, with every, every family is different, and some families you have to be very cautious about. Some families really want to know the facts straight. Um, I usually have to just watch the parents' eyes and see, watch the child's eyes and see how emotional they are about it, and then just kind of tailor the conversation to, to what they're willing to accept at the time. But omitting the conversation and not addressing it is a, a, a medical error. I mean, it's, it's, an, a, it's an act of omission. We really need to take the responsibility. Uh, I, I know it's a very sensitive topic, and, and, and some families get really upset about it. Um, now, I'm not a primary care physician. I'm a neurologist, but I see children who have migraine, who, and that migraine is made worse by the fact that they, they are overweight. Virtually any health care issue you talk about, uh, if the patient is overweight, the outcome is worse. Uh, so my perspective is a little bit biased, but sure. um, I'm hoping that more and more of the primary care doctors will take the initiative and talk to the families and be very up about it. And so it would seem to me that if you have an overweight child sitting there, you probably have an overweight, possible, probable overweight parent. Usually. Yeah. 
Fascinating. Uh, we're glad to have Kate Eggleston with us tonight, who's a policy analyst at the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy. Uh, there's no doubt that this is a very terrifically complex issue. Kate, nice to have you with us today. Thank you so much for having me, You're Kathy. welcome. So we, we've talked a little bit about the medical implications of this uh, for children. So how does the Interfaith Center uh, touch this issue? Well, Dr. Lewis did a really great job of emphasizing how we need to address this problem and how essential it is to address it in our communities. And the goal of the Interfaith Center was to come into the West Western Tidewater area and hear directly from community members about how this issue affects them and their children and how they feel about it and what they think can be done to address the issue. And so you came into Western Tidewater uh, working uh, in, in part with grant funds and the WHRO's Center for Regional Citizenship and a lot of folks coming together at the table looking at this issue, talking to people. Uh, why, why Western Tidewater? I'm just curious about that. Well, it's really interesting, Kathy, because a 2007 statistic statistics say that over 1,125 acres of vegetables were harvested in the Western Tidewater area that year. And it sounds like we should have really great access to healthy food and mm -hmm. produce in the area because we have it locally. However, most of the area is known as a food desert in which mm. people have a lack of accessibility to healthy, nutritious foods. So how do you explain that? What, what's going on there? Well, there in the Western Tidewater area, there are less than one grocery store per 1,000 people. So there's a lack of grocery stores in the area, and there's a lot of geographic isolation if you look into the rural communities who are far away from grocery stores. And there are statistics that show that 20% of low-income families don't have vehicles, or they live further than one mile mm. from a grocery store. So, so, the con the, so, the, the, so the consequence of that is they're buying food where? egg convenience stores and they're eating thrift food, which as we know isn't as healthy or nutritious as, or as fresh as food that you can get at the grocery store. So all that good vegetables, all those good vegetables being, being grown in Western Tidewater probably being shipped out somewhere else. That's right. Yeah, wow. So, so you went to Western Tidewater, you sat down and you talked with folks. Do they think they have a problem? I think they do. I think they realize that they have a problem. There's a lot of really great programs going on in the area. We worked in partnership with WHRO mm -hmm. and the OBC Foundation, as well as the Suffolk Partnership and the Suffolk Department of Health, who are already doing a lot of great things in the area. But we think it's really essential to raise public awareness on this issue. And we mm -hmm. started with the faith communities because they are an integral part of, of making change happen within sure. the community. A anybody who's been to a church supper knows that that is a heart attack on a big long plate, long mm -hmm. table. Well, I'm not true, but you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a whole lot of Velveeta in a, <laughs> in a church supper. So how did you go about dealing with that issue? I think we addressed the problem. Uh, I think faith communities have, have realized that there's an issue mm -hmm. there, but they've also realized that there's a lot of things that they can do to play an integral role in this, such as establishing community gardens that the whole congregation and the surrounding community can use and helping have educational classes and workshops for the community on the different programs that could help address this issue. Mm. Uh, the other thing, I guess, is, uh, is taking a look at some of the activities that are underway right there at the church mm -hmm. and in very active communities, or I should say house of worship, but very active communities communities, there's a lot going on there and a lot of it's oriented around food. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And we realize that uh, it needs to start, change needs to start within family systems and into our congregations and communities and schools as well. So some of the other uh, policy recommendations that you all are looking at, of course, this was going right into the community, talking to the people who would be most affected uh, by this. But then you're, you've also sort of elevated this up into a policy conversation mm -hmm. and some recommendations have come out of that conversation. Well, there have been some laws that have been made in the General Assembly. There was one last year that established that the Department of Health should establish guidelines for schools to have regarding competitive foods, which are foods that children can get in vending machines or in the school stores that aren't part of their oh, lunch program. Oh, that's called a competitive food. Mm -hmm. It's oh, competitive okay. to the program well, which is go. established in the school. So these guidelines would help to ensure that those foods are healthier and more nutritious. But there are other things that can be done as well. We recommend uh, using the body mass index screening tool as a way to screen children for not only uh, issues of overweight and obesity, but also general health issues such as uh, diabetes that Dr. Lewis mentioned before. So I remember when that that proposal first came on the table, this uh, measuring body mass index, and this has probably been five years ago or so, parents, some parents just went crazy on that and they said, you will not be measuring my child's body mass index. It's a huge amount of pushback. Um, again, uh, uh, one of the statistics I thought that was kind of encouraging is that roughly 70% of Americans actually view childhood obesity as a threat. 
uh, and that's a huge that's step a huge forward. change. Yeah. Um, uh, last weekend we were in Suffolk talking about this, so I made the comment that. Ten years ago, when I talked about that topic in an audience, I felt like I dropped a dead fish in the middle of the room. Everybody just turned their head and looked down yeah. on the floor. And now people sit up and listen. And that's important. I think that's where we are now, is we're past the phase of denial. And that, that organizations such as WHRO and uh, getting the word out, uh, this is a huge health problem. And it's tackled at the home level, the community level, and the school level. Mm -hmm. And no one of those entities is going to solve it. As you said, it's yeah. multifactorial. Yeah. The whole community needs to come together. But the, the work starts in the house, in the home. Uh, yeah, and, and so as you think about ways that you're helping families have this conversation, uh, it, it can be tough. And I know sometimes, we, I do a radio show every day, and we, we've talked about this on the radio, we'll inevitably get a call from somebody who's a concerned relative or a concerned friend, and they'll say, gosh, you know, I just don't know how to initiate the conversation, but I'm really worried about the 10-year-old, my 10-year-old nephew who is overweight now, and you have to sort of assume that that may continue unabated. So how do you go about having that conversation? I think that it's just most important to understand that what you're doing is really going to affect your child's future. And so you have to keep that in mind, as well as making sure that you address it in a way that, mm -hmm. that doesn't hurt your child's feelings. Yeah. and that. That's the other piece of it. Is it is a complex emotional issue mm -hmm. too, isn't very it? Very much so. Very much so. That the the portion of children who are overweight or obese or depressed or have anxiety disorders is very very high. I mean, it isn't really? just a physical ailment. Yeah. Um, you know, they're the victims of bullying and teasing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it is a uh, physiological and an emotional challenge. It seems to me it's also complex because we have people who are really advocating around this as a political issue, uh, saying, "Look, uh, we are getting larger as a people." So therefore, I mean, there's some people even uh, are using this as a real political tool and sort of, uh, I, I would term it defiantly fat, you know, the idea that, I, by golly, this is how I am and, and that will be accommodated and that's that's that. Um, how do you navigate that kind of a thing, especially since it is a, as emotionally challenging as it is? Because it does seem like you sort of have this development of a defiant uh, element around this, or a defiant well, segment of the population. Um, I, I guess it depends on what audience you're talking to. If I'm talking to a, an individual family, uh, if I get a sense of real pushback and defiance, it's, it's, it's a dead end street. And all wow. I can do is to pro provide the facts. Wow. When I'm talking to an audience, Usually, there's a mixed population, and for those who are who are who want to you know throw eggs at me, there's also those who think that we're saying something valuable. Mm -hmm. So, I, I think we have to be bold and plow forward and talk about it. Yeah. Uh, it's an important community issue. It's an important healthcare issue. You know, the other the other piece of this I think is very interesting too is when we talk about uh, the amount of food that we produce and the implications of the food industry. Uh, and, and there are so many players in this. It seems to me there's so many more fast food places now than there were when. Most of well, not you. You're 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 much younger. <laughs> but when Dr. Lewis and I were younger, there were far fewer fast food places. I can tell you that. Um, and so, as you think about the political implications of this, you can't ignore that, can you? The 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 role of the food industry in this. No, that's very true. And and one of the recommendations we have is that the schools in the area participate in the Virginia Farm to School program, which connects local farmers to local schools and brings that produce into the schools and. In the western Tidewater area, there are no participating farms or schools. Even though they have all those farms out there. Exactly. Wow. And, and I think we just need to bring awareness to the issue and, and let people know about the farm to school program so that they can learn how to implement it in their communities. It's fascinating. Uh, you mentioned earlier that a lot of the folks in western Tidewater may not have access to transportation. Mm -hmm. and, and that would make it very challenging, of course, to get to the grocery store. Uh, but I wonder, what is your thinking about that connection? Because it seems like transportation would be a piece of this puzzle. It is indeed. So people can't get to grocery stores, they can't get to the food that they need. And, and some of the recommendations that we had to help address that issue is that they need to establish more community gardens and also more farmers markets. Only half mm. of the localities in the western Tidewater area have farmers markets. And also with the existing farmers markets, establishing a mobile component, say for instance, a van that has produce that could go around to the neighborhoods that don't have access to the market. Oh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. It's interesting what happens when you sit people down around a table and start talking to them. You know, all these great ideas come up. That's I find right. that fascinating. And then, of course, there is also this concept of community-supported agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, where you can sign up uh, with a local farm, and every week you, you get a bag of gro you get a bag of vegetables, and you have to figure out what to do with whatever comes out of the bag. <laughs> a challenge indeed, 
at least when it comes to Swiss chard, which is my personal not so much favorite. But um, as you think about this issue in terms of parents, what are you hearing from parents in Western Tidewater? Well, we actually heard a lot from the children about what the parents really? need to do. Oh, yes. okay. What did you hear? We heard from a lot of youth ages 11 to 14, and the main thing that we heard from them is that they want their parents to get up and do something. Their parents are telling them that they need to go out and yeah. exercise and eat healthier foods, but they want to see their parents be good examples really? for them. Really? Interesting. Mm -hmm. And what do they have in mind? Just walking and what, what, what are they thinking Doing about? family activities together uh -huh. that can help um, increase physical activity in yeah. general. Because it's a family involved issue, in the community. It? That's yeah. right, it yeah. really yeah. is. Yeah, it really is. As you think about this, Dr. Lewis, I'm, you know, I look at a lot of the communities in Hampton Roads and some of them are more walkable than others. Um, and it seems to me we live in an era where children don't just run out and play like they used to do. So as you think about that issue, what do you think about the role of that inability to play outside like kids used to do? Well, part of it is, is finding safe places to play. Mm -hmm. um, some of the, in the urban areas, there aren't places that kids can go out after school, particularly this time of year when the sun goes sure. down. Uh, we need to, to look at, and we've talked to uh, city councils in the region about building uh, safe places to play. Uh, making walkable areas. Uh, the Virginia Department of Health has, has uh, roughly uh, $45 million set aside to give to communities to help make safe places to walk, to walk to school. So, uh, and communities are looking at that and trying to figure out how to do that. So that's one of the, the, the vehicles is to, is to make exercise. The other is the families need to kind of limit the time they, the kids are playing the, the uh, life support yeah. systems, uh, with their, their, <laughs> their video games. Um, um, another thing that didn't exist when you and I were a bit younger yeah. was the time spent yeah. in front of video games. Sure. Um, you've heard me talk about the, the Children's Hospital 54321 and then the two part of that is maximum two hours of screen time. So if they can use that other time to go out and get some exercise and go out and walk. They don't have to be necessarily playing organized soccer. Mm -hmm. A good walk with the family, the idea of, of a, a family walk after dinner would be great. So I don't want to put you on the spot. What, what's 54321? What does each other uh, stand 54321, if I can remember them all, okay. all uh, <laughs> uh, five helping of fruits and vegetables okay. is the five, four glasses of water, and what the implication there is not just water but not sodas and, and, mm. and soft drinks and, and fruity drinks which are just empty calories, um, three helpings of low fat milk, so that they use instead of whole milk which is a lot of fat, uh, one percent or, or skim milk, uh, two hours of screen time and one hour of exercise. So if they well do done, that, by the way. Um, I got them all by five of them. Um, <laughs> Um, but it's a it's a, a a program that was actually started in, in the state of Maine, huh. uh, and we took it down here to, to Norfolk and Children's Hospital and uh, EVMS and uh, kind of tailored it a li little bit and made it kind of kid friendly yeah. by five four three two one blast off. Right. Um, but it's a it's a, a thing that families can remember and it works. I, I think I told you once before that when I first heard this, I thought this is kind of hokey. Yeah. Uh, and I tried it. I lost 10 pounds in about six weeks. Really? Um, wow. So, you know, if you stick to it, it works. Yeah. So th the other piece of this, it seems to me, has to do uh, with with policy at a at a larger level. I mean, we talked for, we talked about the lack of farmers markets and the like, but there's also uh, the issue of the food industry in general, uh, subsidies to the food mm -hmm. industry. We hear a lot about that in uh, film productions and, and the like. Um, do, do you see much movement on that level, or are you just in the doctor's office dealing with the end result? Well, I do try and keep my ear to the ground about what's going on in policies, uh, and, and do try and um, uh, uh, talk to some of our local mm -hmm. politicians about this, and the people in the General Assembly, uh, Senator Northam has been a great champion of this for us. Um, I think what gets their attention is the health care costs. Sure. Uh, you mentioned in the opening that there's uh, roughly 75 or 80 billion dollars a year that's lost from productivity mm -hmm. and consequence. That number is projected to go up. Just the diabetes alone. Uh, if you have type 2 diabetes, uh, your health care costs will be about 18 to 20 thousand dollars a year per patient. Now as the population gets heavier and we have more and more kids becoming obese, there's a projection that one in two children in 10 years will have some form of type 2 diabetes. Look one at that. in two. Yeah, it's going. It's it's wow. one in two will be obese, um, um, and that leads to diabetes. So just look at that healthcare. Just just the one medical complication right. along diabetes. Add twenty thousand dollars a year to each of those with a population of three hundred million in our country. Um, we're talking dollars, yeah. and that's what gets politicians' attention. Well, and the truth is, it's not just uh, insurance dollars either, because so much of that is Medicaid and Medicare. Mm -hmm. So. 
uh, that means everybody gets to share it, in that burden if, if we mm -hmm. think about it that way. You know, it's a, it's a fascinating problem and so multifaceted. I wonder if you've looked at other communities around the country, or, and I wonder if you've seen anything in these other communities. You mentioned you've gone to Maine for the 54321. Are any other communities sort of really on the cutting edge on this issue? Well, we look at, uh, there's a beautiful map that on the, of the Center for Disease Control uh, website that if you click in CDC mm -hmm. and obesity, it gives you this map. And this map very nicely shows the epidemic from 1989 till uh, 2009. And it shows all the states getting darker and darker red uh, and the scale changing. But there are a few states that stand out as being relatively light. Colorado, for example, mm -hmm. is, is, is a great state as far as their proportion of obesity, and, and it's very low uh, on a national rank. What's different out there? Um, you know, they have fast food restaurants. They have yeah. probably activity. It's a, that is a population mm -hmm. that's very, very active. Uh, yeah. We need to incorporate that kind of mentality. We need to learn from this, the communities that are, that are um, doing well. So, that are being more successful yes. with this. Yeah, uh, Kate, I wonder, you're with the Virginia Interfaith Center for Public Policy. How is this an interfaith issue? How do you see it connecting there? That's a good question. So the Virginia Interfaith Center is a statewide multi-faith coalition focused on uh, creating social justice through systemic change. So within that social justice, we look at economic justice, environmental justice, so many different issues. And we're really proud to be working on childhood obesity because it actually disproportionately affects the low-income community mm, really? because of lack of transportation yeah. and, and things like that. Mm. Uh, you know, I think too about these children, it, it, there's, there is so much, you know, in this culture, we're so conflicted about this. We, we sort of celebrate the size double zero, and yet mm -hmm. the average size of a woman in this country now is, is 14. So we sort of talk and walk differently, I guess. Uh, you know, my guess is, and you've talked to these children, and you have as well, Dr. Lewis, that must be very painful for, for children. I'm sure that it is, and I think that I, in, in the past, have felt that same pain. Mm -hmm. I think that we probably all have. Mm -hmm. And I think the best thing we could do is be good examples yeah. in, in the way that we think about ourselves and talk yeah. about ourselves to our children. Sure. I wonder, Dr. Lewis, about I that. I have to give them some hope, too. Mm -hmm. um, we can't just rail that there's a problem that, that um, we should be ashamed of. There are programs out there. I mean, not only the uh, getting the, the healthier foods into the communities and particularly into the inner city areas as well. Um, uh, Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters has a Healthy You program and a Healthy You clinic, uh, which is a 10-week program where we bring families in who have uh, weights of their BMIs are above the 85th percentile. Uh, and for 10 weeks, they, they go to grocery stores, they learn what they should buy, what they shouldn't buy. Um, they uh, get involved with the YWCA, YMCA, and get some exercise. And then we, we, we get them into the clinic and follow them. Uh, so there's a program, there are programs that work, they have success. Mm -hmm. They really do have longer term success? Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, initial success is that trend has to kind of stabilize. Yes. Uh, so our first, first bottle of champagne we crack is when, when the trend going up flat plateaus off uh -huh. and then start to get a trend yeah. but the other big focus is targeting the younger children um, uh, one of the things that we talked about on the um, uh, radio recently was uh, the fact that that by age two uh, the template for obesity is set if a child is overweight in that higher percentile ranking of BMI by age two overwhelmingly likely that's going to be an obese uh, school child and an obese mm -hmm. adult so Going after the 400-pound 13-year-old uh, may not have the bang for the buck, not that it's not important, sure. as getting community awareness of, let's look at the two- or three-year-olds. Yeah. If we're going to save this generation, as, as Michelle Obama talks about, oh, let's cure childhood obesity mm -hmm. in this generation, time to start is the two-year-olds. Yeah. That's where we really need to intervene. And I think the, the, the unsung population is grandparents. I think grandparents can do so much. Uh, we, Interesting. We, we learned, one of the first things you learn in pediatrics is that an ounce of grandparenting is worth a pound of parenting. <laughs> uh, so if I can get, we can get grandparents, uh, yeah. get, the, uh, get that, that, our generation out sure. there talking to their grandchildren, talking to their children. Uh, we can make an impact not only in childhood obesity, but infant mortality and, and other so issues. So many others, uh, yeah. Uh, the unsung grandparents. Dr. Lewis, thank you for being with us. I appreciate it. Kate, Kate Eggleston, nice to meet you and congratulations on all the good work you're doing in Western Tidewater. Thank you for having me. I'll be back in just a moment with a final thought. Now there's a percentage of you who just aren't buying this. You're sitting there thinking, just put down the fork. 
But it's really not that simple. If it were, do you think millions of people would endure the ridicule, the workplace discrimination, the bullying, the embarrassment of not being able to fit into an airline seat? Eating is complex. Our culture gathers around food. We produce 3,900 calories of food per person per day, nearly twice what we actually need. And we can pick up fast food at one drive through while looking across the street at another one. Overeating is also expensive. We're paying for it in Medicaid and Medicare and in the private sector as well. In fact, Duke University reported last month that when you put together health care costs, absenteeism, and lost productivity, obesity costs us $73 billion a year. Eating is even political. There are groups fighting sizeism, urging that obesity be covered under the Americans with Disability Act. There's a lot at stake, not the least of which is the potential loss of a generation. Because as you heard Dr. Lewis say earlier, if things don't change, this is the first generation that will have a shorter lifespan than their parents. I don't know how to fix it, but I do know that a one-size-fits-all solution will not work. Neither will television shows where, like the Christians and the Lions, overweight people and forbidden food are thrown into an arena for the entertainment of the masses. The first step, it seems to me, is to find ways to talk about weight with compassion, care, and dignity. And the second step might be to change our attitudes and use the scales the way they were designed to measure weight and not moral rectitude. Because with a subject as, well, weighty as weight, we'll need a lot of tools in the bag. And using shame or exploitation would be like using a sledgehammer to repair a watch. It would break open the case, but with devastating results. Well, you can watch any of our programs again just by logging on to our website. That's whatmatters.tv. While you're there, tell us what you think. You can sign up for our weekly newsletter, and we'll let you know what we're working on as soon as we know what we're working on. On the radio every weekday, noon to 1, hearsay, and I hope you'll join us there as well. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week for another look at What Matters.